divided my talk into two sections. I want to just say a few things about simulations in general and then show you an example of the use of one. I think some of what I'm going to say maybe addresses that question of the relationship between a game and what you learn from it. Some of that comes through the simulation engine itself in a well-prepared game. So the overview is I want to just talk a little bit about what kind of inquiry can take place through simulations. It's a very good example, I think, in the case study that a group inquiry was taking place and the simulation and game space created this space for playing with data and changing. E e the game itself even changed after one uh, uh, run through the game. <coughs> so I think the future of learning analytics at a university like ours will be that there will be faculty groups like that uh, group of four who created that game, creating a variety of learning environments and using those for inquiry. The next uh, issue is about how a simulation can be a model of a complex system. So it can track scores and relationships in the game that are more difficult to track in the real world when we're just using uh, you know, only our minds. But having the computational power uh, enables us to track many more points of data. A little bit about types of simulations. And in the second half, I'm going to talk about the specifics of how we used some of these ideas to create SimSchool. So, uh, Playing games, of course, is very old, and uh, one of the ways you can do it is by not having a computer involved, just doing it through role-based play. And these five things that happen during the playing of a game or, or use of a simulator, notice that in, when it's socially uh, moderated, the time for play is kind of a social experiment, and what you get out of that are the things that you would learn from a social system. So this differs a little bit when we have a computer in the middle of the mix. The time for play uh, allows a different kind of relationship, and I call them reproducible experiments. It means you can rerun the same game many, many times. It'll always respond pretty close to uh, the same kinds of uh, res results uh, if you play it the same way each time. This allows you to have a more of a true experimental relationship to the game platform. So this uh, amounts to a machine realization and model system evolution is what you're really experiencing. So a couple of other ways to, to compare these two is that in the real world, we try to constrain the context by having few variables. We have to have real instruments, so there's a lot of noise in those. And we try to keep the variables as small as possible because we want to control everything in the experimental model so we know what it is that's causing things. And then we collect data. But notice what happens in a simulation you don't really have a constrained context, although in a sense, the space that you've created, the digital space, already constrains for the boundaries. But it, all the toys in that space have affordances, and many times the sort of, even though it's finite, the number is so large it might as well be infinite. So it's a, a fairly unconstrained context. The instruments can be anything that you can simulate, so they're, uh, anything computable fits into the category of the tool you're using. And notice uh, that you can have many variables, of course, because the computer's taking care of a lot of it. This is probably the most important piece, is that data that is not only collected, it's unfolded. What I mean by that is that the engine of the simulator itself already embodies what you can do with it. This is kind of the secret of how do you learn from something. It's not just the reflection part, it's what was made possible in the space itself is the most you can possibly learn from a simulator. So uh, a couple of famous uh, folks in the qualitative literature are Miles and Huberman, and they speak about three levels of linkages that go between qualitative and quantitative. One of them is just quantizing things, and that's when you take information that you can scale or count. Another one is to compare what are people saying, what are the numbers saying. And a third one was the study design itself as a multi-method. I think what's happening is that we have a fourth operation now a fourth type that you, we might call an operational model. So in this case, the linkage between the real world and what we can possibly learn through the simulation engine is done primarily through graphic representations and the qualitative aspects of the engine and the actual operational mechanisms that are underlying how the game is working. So this allows us to model complex systems because it gives all these things. I think I won't talk all the way through this because I'd like to make sure I get all the way to sim school. Probably the most important piece on this one is that emergent behaviors that are unpredictable 
and that must be discovered can still arise even though you have a fully deterministic engine that's running the simulator. So this is because of the nature of systems that have feedback loops. As soon as you introduce a feedback loop, you get complexity. And because of that feature, even when you have a, a real button-down model, it can have surprising behavior. And it's in that surprising behavior, that's where we get our new ahas. That's why working with a game or a simulator, just like the child in the sandbox is playing with a bucket and some water and some sand, learns about volume and space and things you can do and pouring. That's, those are the affordances of that space in the sandbox. In the simulation space, we have new kinds of affordances and we have new sorts of ahas that are possible as a result of it. So this is an example of an early stage design graph for a simulator. This is built in VinSim. And where the words exist in this are actually operational, uh, functional parts of an operating system. So for example, forward velocity that might be at the bottom, that's specifically computed from two other terms, radial velocity and initial velocity. This, by the way, is uh, a model of how you turn your car on a slippery road when there's a curve ahead. So this, this is the game engine for what happens when you reach the curve. And so this is all the physics involved with how your car is going to slip or not, depending on the road, the bank of the... Of the uh, so you can see that this is an abstract model of a real-world situation. We really do drive cars. They really go on banks. They, there is friction under the wheels and so forth. And, of course, as a model, it's not the entire real world because a cat's not going to run out in front of the road uh, in, in this game uh, because we haven't programmed it to do that. In, in the real world it can. So all models are a simplification of the real world, but they can get quite complex. This one, because it has a lot of cycles in it, you can see the arrows going in circles, this one will naturally have very high degree complexity because it's not simply a linear process. It's nonlinear and cyclical. I'm going to run through these relatively quickly. Uh, three types of models are available through simulators, constrained, parameter and epitome models. In sim school, we use a little bit of all three. And I'm going to run to that in a, just very quickly here because the discovery methods in each of the model types are slightly different. You can discover things by manipulating. You can discover things in the epitome model, for example. You discover from the qualitative world, you map how you think a system works, and then you get a simulation model that lets you test how you think the world works. That's the purpose of an epitome model. And it's the reason to involve students in creating simulations and creating games. Uh, but each of the models have something to, to do with a, a type of exploration. So this all led to a, a fundamental question that stands behind Sim School is that can you learn how to teach by playing a game? That was the ultimate question for Sim School. It's a flight simulator that has some AI students sitting in a classroom and we know through the research on it for about 10 years now that it builds a type of knowledge that you might think of as know-how or seat of the pants knowledge, it's heuristic knowledge. It's not the same kind of thing you learn from a book, so you can't always recite the answer back about, for example, how you ride a bike. Now, you might have a thousand different ways to say that, but showing someone that you can do that activity is different than talking about it. So in this kind of knowledge, the know-how or the application of knowledge in the appropriate context. That can only take place if you're given a context and someone can see you applying it. There's no other way to get at it. So traditional assessments, off the table. They don't get it. They, don't, they cannot measure this particular piece. So underlying Sim School is a very simple engine. There's hidden variables behind each student. You can have from 1 to 20 students in the chairs. And this is uh, the hidden variables of each of the students is going to determine how they act in the classroom. Those drive observable behaviors, so you'll be able to see how they're sitting, what they say, whether they're happy or not, that kind of thing. And these are the things that, are con that provide a context for the classroom that the teacher can see. The teacher is the independent variable in this experiment. They're independently enabled to, to decide, shall I teach something now, shall I talk to them, shall I stop teaching, am I done, shall I test them, what should I do next? They're the independent variable in this uh, particular scenario. And that's whatever they do. But whatever they do hits those hidden variables and results in effects that are ongoing effects. 
So throughout the process of the Sim School experience, it's spinning off data uh, relatively rapidly. At each, I think every 10 seconds is a full uh, set of data for as many students that are in the room, and each student is somewhere in a 10-dimensional matrix. So the matrix, uh, there's a psychology and a physiology into learning, and what we've done in Sim School is said for Sally, for example, she has particular visual, auditory, and kinesthetic uh, positions of a personality. That's the first three. And then her variables for her psychology come from a theory called the five-factor model. Uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. That's fear. So um, the fear <laughs> of facing new things and being in a situation and so forth. But that's the ocean model of psychology. And so Sally looks different than uh, Josh does. They're different kinds of people. They're going to respond to things in different ways. And that's kind of that's one half of what's going on in the Sim School simulator. Here's the other thing that's going on is that Sally is faced with a task she has to do. And the tasks have a one-to-one -one relationship with the personality profile. So some things are hard for her to do. They take longer time, and she's trying to raise from where she is at to what the requirement of the task demands. Other things are easy. She can drop down and do them a little quicker. So as she computes across all of this, Sally's taking time to learn, essentially. And the representation of learning inside the simulator is sort of built on those dynamics. Uh, there's a website you can go to and play a free game. Uh, the data that comes out is uh, purposed for analysis and reflection, but also has these sort of uh, critical moment by moment uh, analysis capabilities. So you can look at each vertical line in, the, in both of these graphs. Those are the 10 second intervals. So here we're looking just at a, a 15 seconds worth of learning or so. And those are taking data that we can then uh, do an addition, additional analysis uh, with at a later time. There's a social system that's set up around all of that as well. So ultimately, the reason why this is an epitome modeling platform is that you can create about 10 trillion different kinds of students. You can create the same number of tasks. You can build those into classrooms. So it's a little bit like a sandbox of teaching and learning. Uh, so it doesn't have a preloaded uh, sort of one path only kind of thing. It's more like a playground. Uh, this is an example of the page to create a student. Here's one about creating a class, about how big it's going to be, how what the racial mixture is in the classroom and so forth. And we have an additional piece called the module, which is a little bit like maybe the activity sequence that you were thinking about in the learning scenario, where there's a scenario, a reason for its existence, things you can do to learn in those, uh, during those modules. Then I'll just close with a little bit of the uh, research. We've been researching this for about 10 years uh, in several universities in the US. We have shown uh, moderate to large gains. You can see over the Cohen's D side here that we have 0.72 and 0.63. Those are on the large end of the moderate to large range. And these are for instruments that we've designed around the self-efficacy as a teacher, how confident you feel to get things done. We have reasonably good alpha on the, these instruments. We have pre and post over several years. Here's two examples that are several years apart from 2007 to 2011. Uh, we have another measure that we call locus of control. This is the belief of whether you can make a difference in someone else's life. If you think that if they come to you and they're from a poor family, that you can make no change, that's your locus of control is not in you. You blame the environment and blame them. But So we've seen that people uh, using Sim School over a long period of time, they own that locus of control. They become more responsible for saying, oh, given anything, I think I can figure something out. So they feel more confident as well as changing that locus of control. It's one of the most important findings. Uh, and then lastly, of course, teaching skills. There's a range of about 13 to 15 skills uh, that are, uh, you see the alpha here is fairly good on these. And the results are also good on all of those. Uh, again, the results are there. And uh, then we it's an international program. We have about uh, roughly 12,000 users in 146 countries using it now. And there's a research program that just got started here with Jim uh, over in Humanities, uh, working with uh, Eva DeBosi. Who, so we're looking forward to seeing what the early results look like here at Curtin as well.
Mm-hmm. Happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, David, what kind of tasks were um, sort of simulated in that environment? Yeah, well, you start with a design of a task that's anything that's of interest to you as a teacher. So let's say you wanted to teach someone algebra um, and you wanted to teach them uh, division or something using algebraic language. And then you would use the V, A, K, and Ocean and so forth as the first cut of the requirements of that task. So one of the first things we do in training is to say, oh yeah, for this particular task, is there any particular requirement of someone's openness to new ideas? If it's more calling up uh, solidified knowledge or generalized crystallized knowledge, then it would be lower on the O scale than if it was requiring them to be open to new ideas. And by systematically running across all of those, you define the psychological characteristics of the need of that task. And then the simulator simply says, given a classroom that's this big with this much variety, if I throw that task out there, how's everyone going to do on it? And some will uh, go to it very quickly and rapidly, and you can say, why is that? And others have a big, big problem with that task, and you can say, why was that? <coughs> uh, a research area for the future is to add content-specific knowledge, for example, of mathematics. We have an N number of dimensions that are uh, capable in, that, in the program. I just focused on the, the 10 core variables. We have uh, variables that could be added specifically for representation in math or representation in English or whatever it is. Thanks for the question. Yeah? It is scaling, and we are just letting the web do the work. We're not doing anything in uh, terms of uh, advertisement right now. There's a social group. There are the research papers tend to sort of get the next group. Uh, we got it kickstarted with a grant that was um, allowing us to invite people from around the world to take a look at it, and we would give them training support. So we did have an initial time that kind of got things started. Since then, it's just been word of mouth and people sharing with each other. Great, thanks for the opportunity.